It is 1239, uh, March 12th of 2024, and the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans has a quorum and will come to order. With that, I will pass to Chair Dietzik for some opening comments. Everybody, my internet is unstable, so I'm off camera at the moment. Um, good afternoon, members. Today we're gonna go out of order a bit. Um, we'll start with Senator Wicklund's bill and then move to Senator Kunish's bill. I know other members have bills in other committees, so we may take them out of order as well. Um, so next week we are considering starting at 11 a.m. on Tuesday so we can hear more bills. If you have um, issues with this, let Beth Johnson know. Um, and next week we plan to hear some veterans bill and roll out a um, omnibus veterans bill the following week. So with that, I will hand it back to Vice Chair Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Dietzik. First on the agenda is Senate File 4570 with Senator Wicklund. Could you please proceed at your convenience? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I'm here to present um, Senate File 4570, and this is a bill that was brought forward by the Board of Marriage and Family Therapy, and it is um, to uh, implement a guest licensure bill, a licensure um, for the Board of Marriage and Family Therapy. Um, it creates a guest license, which may be granted upon application to a licensed marriage and family therapist um, who is licensed in another jurisdiction and who wishes to practice in Minnesota, either in person or via telehealth, for a limited period. Once issued, the guest license is valid for one year with practice by the LMFT, limited to no more than five consecutive months. The bill brings the Board of Marriage and Family Therapy in line with its behavioral health regulatory board counterparts. The MFT bill is modeled after the Minnesota Board of Psychology's guest licensure statute. The Minnesota Board of Social Work also has a temporary license statute, and the Minnesota Board of Behavioral Health and Therapy has a statutory provision allowing for temporary practice by a non-resident licensed clinical counselor. Um, uh, an L LMFT guest licensure applicant would be required to verify holding the LMFT license in another jurisdiction. They may not be subject to any current disciplinary orders or complaint investigations. They would be required to complete a fingerprint-based criminal background check and must pay the guest license fee, which will be $150. This license is non-renewable, but the LMFT would be able to gain, uh, be, be able to again apply for a guest license upon expiration of the prior one-year guest license. Um, the guest license is intended to increase access to qualified, competent marriage and family therapy services for Minnesotans by allowing those holding the LMFT license in another jurisdiction to provide MFT services for a limited period. Individuals anticipated to receive services from a guest licensed LMFT may include college students who are home for uh, summer or school break, uh, people who are temporarily located in Minnesota for work or family reasons, or individuals who have permanently relocated to Minnesota while they transition from a prior LMFT to a Minnesota licensed mental health prof professional. Um, and the uh, fee statute is also amended to add the new guest license fee, and um, that is what the bill um, is intended to do. I do have an amendment that Ms. James created, and I think you have a copy of that. So. Yes, and may I move that now? Yes, you okay. can. Senator Morrison moves the A1 amendment. So moved. And. Madam Chair, uh, this amendment, it, it just adds the words marriage and family therapy in front of the word practice so that that is included in the bill language. It's not included, or it wasn't included in the original bill language. Thank you, Senator Wickland. That seems like a pretty basic add. So with that, uh, we will take a vote on that. And then once it's in that order, um, we can begin discussion. All in favor, say Aye for the amendment. Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? With that, the A1 amendment is added. And please, any questions on the bill?
Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Wickland, I just one quick one. On page or uh, line 1.19, it says they must be of good moral character. Is there a legal definition of good moral character? Um, I, it's, it's an ambiguity. I, I get where you're going, and I don't disagree. It's just a little ambiguous for my taste. And I was curious how that's defined or who, who grades it or some, anything like that, or if there's a legal definition. Senator Wicklin. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know if there is a legal definition. I know it is a very common phrase that comes, that is in uh, quite a few of the professional licensing statutes. And I don't know if Ms. James, if you would have any insight into that or a definition that is written out any place. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I do know it's common and I actually, I raise it to our the counsel for my committee, um, and he did a search, and, and it came up in a, quite a few locations. So I didn't pursue changing that. It does seem like it doesn't have a you know real specific de definition. So, <clears throat> Senator Barr, anything else? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, quick, just a quick follow up. Is there more committee stops for this bill, or are we the last one? This one will go to um, a, back to HHS. Okay, just just a friendly suggestion if we could find some way to say maybe instead of I mean good moral character, you know, no felony convictions or something like that. Just so there's something that you could actually grade that by because we all have different definitions of good moral moral character, okay. and I know it's common. So I'm just mm -hmm. friendly suggestion that might be helpful in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for the feedback. Yep. Thank you. With no further questions, Senator Wickland, do you have any closing statements on the bill before we move it? No, I, I think this is a, a provision that would allow you know people who are um, who students who are in another sit state for school, if they develop a relationship with a therapist, then they would be able to come back to Minnesota, and that person could help help continue their treatment here in Minnesota. So. Those relationships are very important. Uh, with that said, Senator Gustafson moves uh, Senate file 4570 pass and be referred to the Health and Human Services Committee as amended. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Senate file 47 passes as amendment and is on its way back to Health and Human Services. Thank you, Senator Wicklund. Thank you. Up next, we have Senate File 3746 with Senator Kinesh. Welcome, Senator. Please proceed at your convenience. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I'm really proud to be carrying Senate File 3746. This is a bill that will standardize health education across our state. Uh, I think we're here to address any questions or concerns around the rulemaking portion of this bill. But before we get there, I do have an amendment, uh, Madam Chair, and I would um, um, like to move and adopt the A4, A4 amendment. Thank you, Senator Kinesh. She, she can't move. Um, does everyone have a, we will move it. Um, does everyone have a copy of the A4? Okay. <laughs> Senator Kinesh, would you kindly explain the A4? You bet. So the A4 amendment removes language that makes statewide wide academic standards optional, because they're not. And even though there are existing optional requirements for districts under the current local health standards, MDE believes this amendment language will account for the germaneness of those statutes until health standards are at the implemented stage. Um, the, Language, if you look at it on line 6.29 through 6.31, um, reads the rules must include at least the expectations for learning listed in paragraphs, and we're striking B, C, uh, B, C, oh, excuse me, B, C, 
and adding in uh, for C, the standards should include consideration of the following existing expectations for learning. Thank you for that explanation. Seeing no questions on the amendment, Senator Carlson moves that the A4 amendment uh, pass. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. With that, the A4 amendment passes. And did you have any further comment on the bill before we open it for questions, Senator Kanesh? I do. I'll explain a little bit. So Senate File 3746 will standardize health education in Minnesota, which is absolutely crucial step towards ensuring that all students, regardless of their location, um, receive a consistent education related not only to their own health, but also well-being of their family, friends, and community. This bill requires the Department of Education to go through the rulemaking process to create new uh, health standards. So rulemaking will allow for any and all interested parties to engage the Department of Education in a transparent process, and that will require the input and buy-in of a variety of stakeholders. We have, uh, I have uh, folks from MDE here to answer any questions you might have related to the rulemaking, uh, if you have any. The stakeholders are the ones that compiled into, uh, into a standards committee. They include parents of school-aged children, teachers, and faculty throughout the state, school board members, members of Minnesota's business community, representatives from the tribal nations, and current students. After the standard committee completes their recommendation, there will be ample time and opportunity for public comment and consideration. Minnesota statute related to this, speci this matter specifically stipulates that the standards they create are clear and objective. They do not require a certain teaching metho methodology. So simply put, the process of crafting this bill and carrying it toward eventual implementation is a process that is objective and transparent and relies on important checks and balances while being open to the public at key junctures. I can go on, but um, if there's uh, any questions or, or um, thoughts on this, I'd be happy to hear it. Thank you, Senator Kanesh. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Um, who, who is the one that uh, brought this to your attention to bring it forward? Well, this is a... Um, Senator Kanesh. Oh, yep. Um, this is an action through um, MDE. Minnesota Department of Education. Okay, and the, the necessary need for this? Senator Kanesh? Sure. So right now, the, um, you know, all of these different curriculums go through a schedule of uh, refresh and um, adopting new updated information. Uh, Minnesota doesn't have those standards in place for health education, and so this would make it happen. And Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Senator Anderson. Um, Senator Kunish, uh, what, do other states have this recommend, uh, requirement? I do Senator believe. Kinesh. Oh, so sorry. Okay. I do believe that other states do have this, and um, up to this point, school districts and even school sites um, have been able to adapt uh, whatever <coughs> curriculum that they want. I know when I was first started teaching, I was a sixth grade teacher in North Minneapolis, and I drew the short stick and ended up having to be the health teacher to sixth graders. And um, at that time in Minneapolis, it was site-based uh, curriculum. So every different school could choose whatever curriculum that they wanted. And so if a student moved from one school to the next, they weren't getting consistent information or they weren't learning the same things or using the same resources. So um, because of that, the, there, there are standards, but we just need to get those refreshed and updated so that uh, our kids really have a, a good general understanding of their own health, the health issues in the community. And um, as we are now moving into an older aging generation, I just met with some folks from the Alzheimer's um, uh, Association that would also like to start talking about how we can introduce the concept of Alzheimer's 
to students because we're finding more and more and younger and younger folks uh, um, with Alzheimer's and it really does affect our communities. So Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Um, Senator Kunish, is there a requirement for this uh, to, uh, in order for them to pass high school and then is it required also for college? Senator Kunish. I don't believe so, but um, if there are folks from MDE that would come up and maybe speak to that. Is there anybody here? When you're ready, if you could state your name and position for the record and then proceed, please. Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Adosh Uni, and I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, and just to clarify for the, um, for the committee, the de department came forward with the clarifying language mm -hmm. for the, that was in the amendment for this okay. bill. Um, just to be clear, the, the health standards are not in the, the governor's policy bill. Um, we've just been providing technical assistance on uh, making it get in the form manner that will work. Can you speak she, into the microphone, Oh, my please. apologies, Senator. Um, just provided a clarification that we brought the amendment forward for the for the chair to, to get the bill in the form and order that would work for uh, the department in our rulemaking process. To your question, Senator, uh, these standards would apply for for K through 12, so our public um, kindergarten through 12th grade uh, schools would have these academic standards that need to be met for students to, to, to graduate. These standards that the department would then adopt, much like anything for math or for English language arts, science, um, arts, um, are, do not apply in the higher education setting. So ma Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. This is another mandate on the schools that they aren't asking for because I don't hear superintendents asking for this health requirement in their curriculum. Senator Kinesh or either one? No, but it is a required subject matter um, and it's not standardized here in Minnesota. And so I think it's really important that we have those consistent benchmarks across the state. And I. I can imagine that most of us would agree that health should be standardized like every other required subject. Most schools do have health programs. It just isn't standardized. But if you're going to mandate it, then it's Senator different. Anderson. Oh. If you're going to mandate it, that's something different. Senator Kinesh. That would be correct. And Ms. Madam Chair, I would like a roll call on this bill. Roll call uh, asked for. Roll call will be granted. Are there any other questions? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Senator Kunish, for bringing this bill forward. Your example of Alzheimer's education, I think, is a great example of how it, ne it needs the curriculum needs to be updated. Um, you know, our state demographer has told us again and again that we are moving into a permanently older demographic. So as our kids are growing up, they're going to be exposed to a lot of older people who begin to struggle with dementia. Um, and they're being able to understand what's happening in their families and their communities, and in some ways being able to help as well um, is imperative. Vaping is another great example of something that is new, that is relatively new and has changed. And we have a lot of evidence that we're really good at preventing youth tobacco product use. Uh, we almost stopped cigarette smoking among our youth. Um, and then the vapes came along. So these are really important tools for to empower our young people with uh, so that they can uh, be healthy and be their best selves. Thank you. Did you want to respond or just nope. go with it? OK. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, uh, Again, i just shocked at the bill we're seeing in front of us. We're under one party control. We have a bill that's all Democrat. And now we're giving more power to our agencies to define what our students were taking local control away while we're in one party control. Uh, I think it's a terrible bill. I, I'm sorry, but uh, this is a power grab by the agency, the administration, by the Democrats to put it their way and not local control. Local school boards are being taken out of it. Each individual community is different. I understand being somewhat standard, but you're doing it under full control. Uh, you know, my, my next question is, so item 7.1 and 7.11, it says cannabis use and substance use education. So are we teaching our kids how to use marijuana now that it's been legalized, or are you trying to keep them away from it? 
we talked about tobacco use and how we're getting kids off tobacco, and then you legalize marijuana, and are you teaching them how to use it or not to use it? I guess it's, it's confusing. If you could answer the, the cannabis use issue, would be one. But again, this bill is just something that people in greater Minnesota and the state are wondering, why is this full control power grab going on? So lots of questions there, but it's unfortunate what, what's happening here in this legislature this year. Senator Kanesh. I, I would not say this is a power grab in any way, shape, or form because this bill doesn't change the fact that health is still a required subject matter to graduate. And so this is a case where everyone in Minnesota will have the same information. Um, I would not imagine that there would be instructions on how to um, partake of a cannabis use in these health uh, bills. I'm sure it would talk about responsible use and responsible uh, efforts to to ad address addiction. And and cannabis is not the only thing out there. I mean, look at all the the liquor and all of the other things that that kids get addicted to. We don't open up a health uh, a health book where it talks about alcoholism and um, the side effects of alcohol and say, here's how you make a cocktail. So um, I think your concerns are certainly inflated and, and certainly not what a health book would include. Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to go back to page 321, line 321. I'm curious why you're adding the Youth Council into education standards for uh, its government history. I mean, it, this is is added into all of them the, the, where they're considered advice from all these stakeholders on the following topics. It's math, English, science. Why is the educated being, it, it, in my mind, I'm thinking that the phrase, and I don't, don't want this out of context, but the phrase is the inmates are running the asylum. So why are the students getting to decide on the curriculum part? Could you help me with that, please? Uh, and if I may, just for one second, um, we actually looked at the cross-reference about cannabis um, that is in the bill, and it specifically states in the cross-reference that is noted, um, the education would be um, the negative health effects, unsafe or unhealthy behaviors, signs of substance abuse, treatment options, and healthy coping strategies. So there's nothing in there that would um, show kids how to use an, a possibly addictive substance. With that, um, going back to Senator Barr's question, please. Senator Kinesh. Sure. So the Youth Council is a really unique group of uh, young people who have an interest in being part of the conversation when we are uh, governing or we are creating policy and funding uh, things that, that really affect them. They certainly are a strong voice. Uh, when it comes to any of these issues because they are speaking from their experience. Um, we can sit here and mandate all we want or we can decide this is what a curriculum is going to be or we can pass legislation that we think is going to help our students, but it's really their voice that we want to hear from and what is it that they think that they need. I mean, we could... We could do all sorts of things, but it's really their voice that can help guide us when it comes to those sort of situations. I was a teacher for 25 years, and kids have a lot of opinions, and a lot of times they're based on their personal experiences. They're based on what they're seeing in their communities, in their schools, in their families, and they have a very, very valuable voice to share, and I think it's really important that we listen to the, their opinions. And so, yes, I, I believe that the Youth Council should be a part of this discussion. Senator Barr? Oh, sorry, I mistook the, the wave. Uh, Senator Drazkowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Um, do we have, is there a fiscal note for this bill or a local impact note or both? Senator Kunish? I do not have the fiscal um, um, uh, note for the rulemaking part Senator of this. Senator Kunish, uh, we could also go to... Oh. Mr. Erickson, okay. if that's helpful. Mr. Erickson. 
Mr. Erickson? Yes, Madam Chair and members, there's a fiscal note request that's out. It hasn't been completed yet. Uh, I don't know what it'll show on behalf of, of MDE, but as far as the stake of portions, the rulemaking will be a cost uh, that OAH will bill back to MDE. Um, so that's what I would expect to see for stake of. I'm not sure what it'll show for, for MDE. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Madam Chair, is a plan to pass this out of committee without a fiscal note? Uh, where, where does this bill go today? Senator Jaskowski, this will go to Health and Human Services, so it still has another. Or, I'm sorry. Okay, so, Madam Chair, uh, will this, this bill... Will I apologize. It will go to Education Finance, uh, so it does still have another stop. Okay. So, Madam Chair, will this... Um, Will this bill be going out without us being able to scrutinize the costs of the state around rulemaking? So the fiscal note is not ready yet, as we heard. But um, again, it will go to education finance. So it will still get scrutiny at that committee. So Madam Chair, it would not get our scrutiny, though. This is a committee that provides the scrutiny around Items related to rulemaking, and it's obviously a major state cost in the bill. And as we saw last year, this legislature, this Democrat-controlled Senate, is planning to ram this through the process again without the right type of scrutiny to happen. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, we saw multiple bills last session. We saw a tax bill that we already provided a fix-it to. Uh, there's a bunch of other fix-its coming through. Uh, who knows what they're going to do with the cannabis bill because it is such a big mess. And now uh, what I'm hearing, Madam Chair and members, is the plan is to push, again, another very controversial um, power grab of a bill through without providing the scrutiny at the original committee jurisdiction that should provide that scrutiny. And there's a deliberate effort to ignore it in this committee process. For members of the public, that should be very concerning that we have either an, a, a, a legislature that is being willfully ignorant about this or lazy or both. I don't think this is what anyone here wants to do is to be willfully ignorant around the center of what we're supposed to be doing here, and that's providing scrutiny to legislation that comes before us. And Madam Chair, members, and Representative Kanush, um, this bill is written by the Minnesota Department of Education. The Minnesota Department of Education wrote this bill. The state government is wrote this bill and is going to tell local school districts what they need to do and provide these mandates to them. Additional costs. Now, members, we're going to be over 64 mandates that were passed last session. Now there's going to be 65 or, or more in this bill. And we're going to continue to pile it on the school districts. They were reporting to me last week that... They can't afford the mandates that are in front of them that you guys passed on them last session. They don't have money to do the READ Act in Kenyon Wanamingo. Our schools are failing, and the one bright spot I saw in the massive education spending bill that had $2 billion of spending was a READ Act. And I think it was Senator Gustafson's bill. I don't remember whose it was, but there, there at least was a will somewhere to teach kids to read, and I was so excited out of, out of all the rest of the, the huge masses of mandates that were passed on school districts, at least there was some intent for them to read. And you know what? They can't afford it now. They can't afford to do it. And we're passing another mandate. Madam Chair, is there a local impact note for this bill? Senator Drazkowski, there is not. Was one requested, Madam Chair? Was a local impact note requested for this bill that will place local uh, mandates on school districts? Does this, does this legislature even care to ask the local unit of government what this mandate will cost them, or are we just going to pass it on to them 
and again, be willful, ignorant, ignorant and don't care. Senator Draskowski, to answer your question, uh, local impact notes can be requested either by the majority or the minority. So I can speak for the majority and say that there was not one, but I cannot speak for the minority, which also would have had a chance to request that. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And members, um, in the past, in my experience in the legislature, uh, it's the people bringing a bill forward that have the responsibility. It's the it's the author or, and or uh, the party um, of the um, of the member bringing the bill forward that requests local impact notes. Or, Madam Chair, it's the chair of a committee that is coming forward that through that should have certainly interest and concern about what this is going to do in this case to local school districts and we don't even know and it it appears that we don't even care what this is going to do to local school districts we're just going to pass this rip away their local control and senator kanish i i mean i heard you say that uh this isn't isn't uh, a power grab it isn't state government coming in and usurping local uh, jurisdictional um, authority, but indeed it is. Uh, current law provides the ability for local school districts to define these health area um, uh, curriculum items on their own that would be locally and culturally adopted for them, by them, customly developed, the most local direct input by people in a local school district are doing it now. And so we're going to throw that away and we're going to have this big, this big mandate that comes in front of them. The Minnesota Department of Education is going to tell them what they have to do. And it's right here in the bill. Madam, and then they're going Madam to come Chair, in and develop. One clarification? And then they're going to, excuse me, Senator. And then they're going to come in and they're going to develop a bunch of rules um, and tell them what they have to do. We haven't even seen the rules yet that are gonna come out of here. We, we grant them additional authority in this. This is a huge power grab. It's stealing from our local school districts their authority and granting it to the Walls administration. This is not what we should be doing, members. Let's send this bill back, uh, maybe back to the, to, the, to the woodshed or somewhere. It needs to go somewhere different than this committee or the Education Committee. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Draskowski. Uh, just one point of clarification. I would like to give credit where credit is due. It was Senator May Quaid who brought the, brought the Reed Act, um, and my elementary school teachers, where my kids go, love that one as well. Senator Kanesh. Thank you. I, I would just like to also clarify that it was not MDE that, that made this bill, and maybe uh, Mr. Uni would like to respond to that. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, again, for the record, Adoshuni, uh, Minnesota Department of Education. Yeah, just to, just to clarify and echo uh, Chair Kunish's uh, point here is um, the Department of Education uh, didn't, uh, this is not in the governor's bill, um, hasn't been proposed by us. I think there may have been some confusion. The department did provide some technical assistance in the amendment that was adopted by the committee initially that would adjust uh, the bill to put it in the form and manner that if this were to become law, that the department would be able to implement in alignment with how the standards process for academic standards are usually run. Thank you for the clarification. Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Senator, for bringing this bill forward. I just, I, um, you already know this, but I was astounded to find out that there's no statewide health standards. Uh, I just, in this day and age with the World Wide Web and the Internet, with respect to so many of these issues um, that are listed here, vaping, cannabis use, sexually transmitted diseases, to not have kids learning that, those concepts, those ideas, those those issues that every um, many young people face, and, and the, the first line seven four with mental health being mentioned first and foremost, I, I just can't imagine a, a, a school district in Duluth feeling that the, the health requirements for their student age population are going to be any different than they would be in um, Lucerne and. Uh, so thanks for bringing this forward. I think your example of being the sixth grade teacher and having to um, um, drew the short straw, 
just ex expecting a 22 year old teacher right out of college is going to want to teach different health class um, if it's le left up to local control. That 22 year old teacher right out of college is going to have a totally different idea on what she or he thinks the kids should be learning compared with a 65 year old teacher in, in the um, latter years of their teaching career. I, it just seems like we should have standards. And with respect to one of my colleagues' questions about the youth council, um, I'm glad to see that this. Um, but the standards development that there maybe be one or two young people that have so much more insight into what their needs are than maybe we have. And so, um, I, again, I just uh, can't thank you enough. Besides citizenship, <clears throat> um, this might be the most important um, course um, passed out of this or standards that are passed out of the legislature in the last couple of years. So um, thanks for indulging me, uh, Madam Chair. And thanks again, Senator. It's a great bill. Thank you, Senator Swazinski. Senator Cran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Kunish. On, and I just, the one comment on the, uh, I think Senator Barr brought up about the, the students and of stakeholders, and I agree, I, I agree they're important. But if you look through the entire list of all of the stakeholders, um, parent, parents, right, we don't call out a specific parent organization. We used to call them school boards, um, which is important, which you're taking away their authority to do that in this bill. Um, so to me, you'd call it a youth council. We'd love, right, we'd love to see um, youth participate. I don't think we're opposed to that. But nowhere else in there do you call out other specific organizations from a, a, a category of parents. There's many parent organizations. Um, I think it'd be rare to find one, especially if it was included in one of, one of these bills, which it would be uh, an open and broad, uh, uh, maybe a diverse set of thought included into that council. So those, those are concerns. But let's talk about the rulemaking process and the re reason we're here today is with the uh, Department of Education, they're still here. I just have a quick question for them. And as he comes up, uh, the only other person I have on the list is Anderson. Um, and then I would like to go to a vote if that's possible because we still have five other bills that we need to hear in our time here today. Um, if you could please again state your name for the record. Thank you. Madam Chair Committee, Adoshuni, Department of Education. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so um, Department of Education has typically a, a broad set of rulemaking authority. Do you have rulemaking authority today? that could cover any of, and or any of these topics and or other topics related to health issues? Madam Chair, uh, Senator Coran, we have very specified, explicit, like explicit to uh, the, the rules that we have to adopt to uh, review and revise academic standards as they are set on a 10-year cycle. And so currently, health standards are locally determined, and the Department of Education does not have rulemaking authority around health standards. We do have rulemaking authority around the six uh, academic uh, standards that have statewide academic standards, and we review and revise those on a 10-year cycle. Madam Chair. So Senator Cran. And so the department have never, has never gotten engaged in rulemaking outside of the authority around the 10-year annual review of standards or any other, any other place um, or any other standards you have not engaged in rulemaking. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Cran, um, if, you're, uh, if you're asking outside of sta academic standards, I believe we've engaged in the past in rulemaking in the achievement and integration uh, we had explicit rulemaking around achievement and integration. I'm not familiar if we have standing rulemaking for other areas. I'd have to look into that. But we do have standing rulemaking authority on the 10-year cycle as spelled out per, per statute for academic standards. Thank you. And Madam Chair, and so with that, so you, you can make rules and you have made rules. And so in this particular series, it's kind of bizarre. Normally, it's very dis prescriptive and then the rulemaking is engaged. In this, the, uh, help me clarify, and, and Senator Kunish, if you could, on 7.1, uh, the rulemaking that you're directing them to, which they didn't ask for, uh, must include at least the expectations for learning in, in paragraph B. Is it limited to those things in paragraph B? Senator Kunish. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'm, I don't believe so. Um, it's in the so, uh, line 6.3 to the standards must include expectations. Um, so these must be included in there. Am I looking at the wrong? Yeah. So it includes at least the expectations for learning, and then it lists them out. Madam Chair. Senator Cran. Senator, Senator Kunish, so it, those are, it's a great set of recommendations, but not, not um, all inclusive of what that rulemaking. So the rulemaking that you're opening could be unlimited in any way, in any topic. These are guidelines, but it says it must at least, but could include many others the way I read it. And so when we look at, you know, the, the, in section B or paragraph B, they look pretty benign. I think those are mental health. I, I, they look like things that are included in every health class that I've ever been a part of relative to the time, right? The, the time and, and manner in which it was. Um, vaping didn't exist. Cannabis didn't exist. Um, and so I, I don't understand why we'd grant broad rulemaking authority um, to allow these things to be put into place when it seems to be pretty straightforward. I actually agree with uh, Senator Morrison on, on the aging and elderly, you know, uh, Alzheimer and all of those things I think would be important. I frankly don't think our, I, I wished our high school kids were more um, prepared to be able to handle that, handle those issues at that age. Um, but then when we get into paragraph B, the optional side, um, it says it could implement, open, uh, could not required by districts to implement the optional expectations. Well, I have no faith that optional will turn into mandatory, but in the optional side in C, um, sexual abuse, all those things pretty, seem pretty straightforward. Violence prevention education, I, I think that's what we hear all the time, right? Treat people fairly, no bullying, none of those things. Um, it's probably more important today with the violence in our schools, but I don't know that, the, that a health class is going to help them with it. Character development and education, we would hope that they're getting that at home. But tell me what safe and supportive schools education means. It seems like a pretty broad category. Is that the end of your question? Yes. Senator Kanesh, or I see Ms. Erickson has joined you, so. Yep, I think um, Ms. Erickson can explain that for us. Ms. Erickson, could you please state your name and title for the, quest for the record, please? Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Sarah Erickson, on behalf of the Women's Foundation and MNCASA, the Minnesota Coalition of Sexual Assault, um, Senator Coran, the, um, the the cannabis that you outlined and the smoking and mental health, for example, are already in current law and required and required to be taught, which is why you see them articulated in the bill. Um, the, the remaining kind of questions that you have, the idea behind this bill was to allow a rulemaking process where parents got to weigh in and the community got to weigh in and students got to weigh in because I don't know that we felt that we were experts enough to sit around a table and make decisions about what health standards should look like for students across the state. So it is intentionally um, open to allow for those discussions to happen during the rulemaking process when the public public has an opportunity to engage. Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. Yep. Senator Coran. And thank you, Ms. Erickson. Well, well, those those all sound really good. The rulemaking process, we actually have local input every day that's measured and in input by parents who elect the school boards and decide, make those decisions, which are appropriate for the community. So we have all those things in place today. And you just described that it's more of recommendations, since it's already included in statute, um, to be able to go through it. I'm just worried, opening rulemaking in a broad category, because I think it could go into anything, um, and removing local control is not what we're about. So, so to me, I found it interesting this wasn't a, a Department of Education request, but in this arena, we've seen such gross overreach in talking about what's appropriate in the schools for, for students, and that teachers override parental 
rights and, and guidance. That's why we collectively bring them, each individual parent, we can't meet their individual needs, right? Everybody has various opinions. But that's why we have elected school boards, to represent the community. They're from the community, in the community, and it should be left at the local control. So for that, Madam Chair, I can't support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coran. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Kunish, uh, there is a letter here from the uh, Minnesota School Boards Association, Minnesota Association of School Administrators, Minnesota Elementary School Principals, and the Minnesota Association of Secondary School Principals, and they were asking the opportunity to discuss this bill with you further. Did you have opportunity to meet with these uh, individual groups uh, or members that this letter is addressed to you and to Representative Witham? I believe that's Yo, Witham. Kim? No. Oh, Carly Watiza oh, uh, Watun. Excuse me, I didn't quite catch that. Representative Watiza Watun. And you said you met with these people? No, I, I have Kinesh. not. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, I have not had um, a request, or I do, have not had an appointment with them. Um, Madam Chair, Senator this, Anderson? Bill, this letter was dated February 29th of this year, uh, sent to both offices regarding 3746. And it states in here that Minnesota Statute 4.010 urges the legislature to retain a school district's local authority in determining curriculum, course offerings, graduation requirements, and other locally developed standards who are applicable. In summary, we say, while statewide health standards may offer consistency and uniformity, they risk overlooking local needs and undermining community engagement, taking parents and educators and community members out of the picture, that our families and communities want. Local control provides the flexibility, the accountability, and the responsiveness necessary to address the diverse health challenges facing our K through 12 students effectively signed and respectfully those four. And so I'm just wondering if uh, why you haven't seen this letter and now we get to see the letter. Senator Kanesh. Well, I can't tell you why I haven't seen it, but I've been in meetings with all of those folks and and we haven't had that, that conversation. Um, but I do wanna just stress that standardizing a subject matter doesn't require teaching styles or methodologies. It only sets the learning destination for our students here in Minnesota. Those local units are still responsible for determining how the students reach this learning desti destination. So in other words, school districts and charter schools will still be able to determine how their students will meet those developed standards. We create the standards and then the school districts are, are responsible for making sure that those students meet those standards. So perhaps there will be different curriculum that are chosen across the state, but as long as they meet those standards, then they are, um, then they are doing what is, what is expected. So um, it's the same for every major subject matter that is standardized. Well, Madam Chair, Senator Kunish, uh, this bill, uh, as we've already been mentioned here, uh, has no fiscal note, or there's one on the way, supposedly the way. in the works somewhere, somehow, yep. and uh, no local impact statement that was made by you or your office. And so uh, if you had talked to them about this bill, I'm sure you, told, you would have told them how much it would have cost them, because right now I'm hearing from my representatives at the school districts that the money you gave them last year doesn't meet the mandate cost that it's gonna help, help them try to get through all the things that you put on their backs. And this is another thing that's gonna put their backs on. And unless they know that, uh, they're, they're asking for, leave us alone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator, okay. Senator Draskowski for a second time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Senator Kanish, um, it sounds like maybe it wasn't the Department of Education that wrote the bill. Do we know who wrote the bill? Senator Kanish. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So this is something that I've been working on since I was uh, in the House. But um, if you would like to maybe talk a little bit more about the group that helped put this together. Mm -hmm. Ms. Erickson. 
Um, Madam Chair, Senator Drozkowski, you do have a letter of support in your packet from the coalition of um, member groups who helped put that together, and I won't articulate it because I'll forget some, but you should have it in your packet. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. Senator Drozkowski? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. So, Ms. Erickson did, and I, and I just had this handed to me. I didn't have it in my packet. Somebody said it existed, but there's a one-sided letter that includes on the end the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, the Minnesota Associate Coalition Against Sexual Assault, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Youth Prize, the City of Minneapolis, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Ed Allies, Reproductive Health Alliance, Hennepin County, Minnesota Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and Minnesota School Counselors Association. Is that the consortium you mentioned, and did they write the, did they write the bill? Ms. Erickson. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Drozkowski, um, I think in all candor, I would say that um, th that is a group that is supporting the bill that you see before you. I think there's probably a handful of people, myself included, representing the Women's Foundation in Mancasa that like physically did the work of writing the bill, if that's what you're asking. Senator Drozkowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. So we, we have... Uh, a bill in front of us, again, is written by a consortium of interest groups to give, and in that interest group, it's, it's interesting to note, the city of Minneapolis and Hennepin County. So there's interest in the city of Minneapolis and Hennepin County of dictating our education policy to our 333 school districts throughout the state of Minnesota. Let that sink in, members, as we think about and realize this power grab that we have in front of us. Um, none of my school districts in, um, in my district, none of my cities or counties are on this letter or were part of this. Uh, but this particular group of interest groups that, that got together and decided uh, we need to do this this way, a centralized approach that hands over authority, huge amounts of, of authority to the executive branch and take some away from local units of government, not the direction we want to go. Um, we could have Madam Chair and members and, and uh, Senator Kanush and Ms. Erickson and, and Commissioner, we could have a different set of interest groups write a different bill that might do something completely different. But that doesn't make it uh, so that we should adopt that as statewide policy uh, because different interest groups all, di all represent different slices of interest in our state. And our state is much bigger than that. We've got policy right now that gives the ultimate of local control to our school districts. This bill rips that local control out of the hands of those 333 school districts and turns it over to the executive branch and the Minnesota Department of Education, making them bigger and stronger and making our school districts smaller and weaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please vote no. Madam Chair. See, okay, I was just about to call for the, the motion. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Kush. So again, going back to the letter that Senator Anderson brought up, uh, again, the Minnesota School Board Associations, that group, is urging the legislature to retain school districts' local authority in determining curriculum, course offering, graduation requirements, and this bill is doing the opposite, correct? No. Senator Kanesh. How is it doing differently? Because they're asking for local control. Uh, Senator, I gave Senator Kanesh the opportunity okay. to answer. Okay, just as I said a little bit ago, what we're doing is we're standard, standardizing the health standards so that every school district will have that opportunity within their local control, within their school district, to decide what the curriculum is that they will use to meet those standards. So we're just setting the parameters, we're setting the expectation just as we do for math or reading or science or FIAD or reading. There is no standardized expectation for health um, education, though it is required, and therefore we're creating that standardized expectation. Thank you, Senator Kanesh. Senator Jasinski. No more questions. Thank you. With that, uh, Senator Carlson moves that Senate File 3746, 
pass and be referred to education finance. A roll call was requested. A roll call will be granted. Um, the Senate file 3746 as amendment, as amendment pass and be referred to ed finance. Roll call was requested. Roll call was granted. Can you please take the roll? Chair Mitchell. Uh, aye. Chair Desick. Aye. Senator Anderson. No. Senator Barr. No. Senator Carlson. Aye. Senator Swadzinski. Yep. Senator Dreskowski. No. Senator Fate. Senator Gustafson. Aye. Senator Jasinski. No. Senator Horan? No. Senator Lang? Oh. Senator Lang? Oh. Senator May Quaid? Aye. Senator Morrison? Aye. Senator Fate? With seven ayes and six nays, Senate file 3746 uh, as amended passes. It is headed to education finance. Thank you so much, Senator Kanesh and all your partners that worked on this. I appreciate it. Next up, uh, as patiently as Senator Wesson has been waiting, and we acknowledge that, um, we have another committee member that has to go present somewhere else. So we're gonna switch up the order. That committee member happens to be me, so I am going to ask Senator Morrison to step up so that I can present uh, one, if not two, bills. Welcome to the testifier's table, Senator Mitchell. Please proceed. So uh, thank you. I am here today to present Senate file 4428. I know that is a slightly different order than um, is on the list. Um, and this re relates to the Public Utilities Commission being added to the list of agencies that are uh, subject to certain obligations with um, tribal governments. The Public Utility Commission has already since 2019 been engaging in um, conversations and practices that um, there's basically you know, coordination done on certain projects. And um, this is supported both by the tribal process and by the PUC. Um, and it puts it in line with other commissions under the state of Minnesota that do that coordination before certain projects. This is a pretty simple, um, no known objection to this from any other group. And as I said, um, it just basically codifies what the PUC has already been doing since 2019 and their practice there. Um, I do have someone from the PUC just for questions, but because this is uh, hopefully pretty basic, we're gonna try and keep it simple. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Members, questions? Excellent. <laughs> uh, do you have a final word? I do not, ma'am. Okay. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Uh, Senate file 4428 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Senator Mitchell, do you have time for your next one? I, I believe I do. Senate Let's file 3660. Get it going, and yeah. if not. <laughs> um, so, Senate file 3616. And um, just for reference, this has already been heard in elections, so the elections uh, component has already received a hearing on this, and it has also already heard, um, been heard in higher education. But what this bill would do would take our college campuses that have over 1,500 students, and um, of which there are just over 50 around the state of Minnesota, 
and it would give them the ability if either the administration or the student body asks to request a one day early voting site. And the reason for that is um, colleges that have had something similar, if their county has put it in or if the, you know, the students have been able to coordinate that, um, it's been very successful, very asked for by the students because especially on some of those larger campuses, they don't have transportation to perhaps easily get to wherever the same day voting is. Um, they might be new voters who might need access to same day registration or other things. And the other nice thing about this is that for the site, anyone in the county could actually use that one day early voting location. Um, and so that would just give people another opportunity to vote. So with that, um, I do have a testifier here today to um, kind of talk about the need and why students feel this is so important to making sure that they have that access to vote, which we're very proud of in Minnesota. Uh, is Lily Sass, is that? Please come to the testifier's table, thank you. And please correct me if I mispronounced your name. Welcome to the testifier's table. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, Lily Sassy, so very close. Um, <laughs> I am the director of We Choose Us. We're a coalition of grassroots organizations and advocacy groups working to build a multiracial democracy in our state. And there's a reason that this bill rose to the top as one of our four priorities this year because our organizational partners know how much this would mean for students. We've heard some really great testimony in both the House and the Senate from students themselves about the impact this bill would have on them and their peers. From lacking consistent access to transportation, to having busy schedules and not getting time off to vote on election day, students can face many barriers to the ballot box. The ability to identify this need in their community and request an on-campus voting location could be a game changer. I am also speaking as someone who graduated in the not too distant past myself. I have firsthand experience of how having an on-campus location at the University of Minnesota, for example, made the difference for many of my friends. When it came to election day and I reminded folks to go vote, being able to say it was only a couple of blocks away allowed them to fit it in between their classes and feel a deeper sense of connection in their community. But right now, only a handful of students have that opportunity. Young people are often told we are the future, simultaneously identified as a target audience because we have lots of potential, but low vo voter turnout, so we're often not considered to be a good enough return on investment. But that low turnout is not because we don't care or aren't knowledgeable. It's because we have a deep awareness that this process wasn't designed for us. We see and feel the barriers to access and inconsistent investment. But allowing students to access on-campus early voting locations is one indicator from our elected officials that you believe in young people's voices and that they matter in our democracy too. I urge you to consider this as you debate the bill before you today, and I strongly encourage the members of this committee to vote yes. Thank you, members, and Senator Mitchell for your leadership. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Sassy. Oh, and then we have another testifier, Troy Olson. Please come to the testifier's table. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Uh, my name is Troy Olson and I represent the Minnesota Association of County Officers, which comprises of uh, county auditors, treasurers, recorders, and election administrators in uh, Minnesota's 87 states. So thank you for this opportunity. Counties. Counties. <laughs> thank you. Counties. Um, I would just like to draw your attention to the letter in your packet uh, and summarize that election administrators are supportive of convenient polling locations that can be administered efficiently and effectively, but do have some concerns about uh, Senate File 3616. Uh, election administrators appreciate the new authority to establish temporary polling locations that was given to them just last session and request maintaining this as an option rather than Im implementing this uh, mandate before any statewide general election has actually taken place since the new authorization. 
Uh, MAKO also has concerns over granting non-governmental organizations the authority to establish uh, polling locations, anticipating a large number or or not knowing for sure how many institutions will trigger the mandate, will stretch limited resources funding our elections even further. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Mitchell, is there a fiscal note for this bill, and a, a local impact statement uh, for the cost to the counties and to those that are putting in on these elections? Senator Mitchell. Uh, Senator Anderson, I believe one has been requested, um, but it is not back yet, is my understanding, unless Mr. Erickson knows any differently. Um, I, I will add that um, one of the student organizations that did this said it cost about $1,000 when they helped, like, get those resources in and we've had estimates from the counties that it, it might be about $2,000 per site once you've surveyed a site, know the site and kind of have it going. Um, most of what the cost would be would be election workers for the day and then all the ballots for the location. But if we look at that in terms of ballots, those ballots would actually have to be you know, printed and used one way or the other, so that cost was kind of added in there. So those are the two primary costs that would be associated with this. I would also like to add that um, this would be, school's not in session in, in August, and it, so this would really be a general election, um, and it's written in there that way, a, a one-time cost every two years, and only for the schools that asked for it. And the reason that we left it, instead of saying that you have to do this if you're 1,500 or above, it is actually because we did want to be mindful because some schools have more commuter students um, and might not have that need, so then they wouldn't have to request it. And that is actually why that is um, the, the one thing that kind of touches this committee because, as I said, this has already really gone through the two primary com committees that needed to look at it is that we did it, that it would be a request instead of a mandate, so to speak, because like with senior homes, we do that and it's just, if you meet the criteria, it's automatic. Here it's not automatic, it has to be the request, but we did that knowing that some schools would not request it and we didn't want the counties to have to allocate the resources where they were not needed. So we actually did that and as, as a mindfulness making sure that it wasn't, those resources weren't, weren't going to schools that were saying, you know, we don't actually need this service. Senator Madam Anderson. Chair. Uh, so, <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, Senator Mitchell, I see that uh, we don't know really the cost of what it's going to co cost the locals to put this on, but I do see a letter here in our packets from We Choose Us Coalition, 40 grassroots organizations, unions, and advocacy. Would they be willing to pay for this? Senator Mitchell. Uh, Senator Anderson, I can't speak for them, but I would say as the state of Minnesota um, runs the elections through the counties and through the cities, I believe it would be inappropriate for us to ask organizations to pay so that people could vote. That, that is the duty of the elected offices and the offices that run that. We should not be charging, uh, to me, at, at a very basic level, it almost seems like a poll tax if we would make people pay for their own polling locations, be it themselves or through an organization. So, Madam Chair, Senator, Senator Mitchell, Anderson. but you're mandating the counties to pay for it. Senator Mitchell. Uh, Senator Anderson, which is what they do for the election, the administration of all elections for all, unless it's delegated with the cities, for all um, early voting sites. My county, for example, has uh, for six full weeks before the election, every day, early voting sites. Um, I, and I have worked at those sites, and sometimes you're only getting 20 or 30 people a day, and they keep those open for weeks. So for me to be able to give extra access to 1,500 people then that's just the students. That doesn't include the fact that staff would be able to vote there, locals would be able to vote there. To me, that is a tremendous bang for the buck. But yes, 
all elections are paid for by you know, the counties with state funds and, and through those resources. So, Madam Chair, Senator, Senator Mitchell, Anderson. have you talked to the counties about this bill? Senator Mitchell. Yes, Senator Anderson, I have. And you just heard from the counties. Obviously, they just want to make sure that, um, you know, what the funding ends up being is something that has been covered. There was a lot of funding from elections that came down last year um, that gives them some, some supplemental to do some of these things. And if it ends up being something that we need to invest more in, then that is something we can certainly look at in the future. And, and again, I'm happy to answer any questions, but all of this was covered, this, that part um, was covered in elections, which is where that part of this bill's jurisdiction was. Senator Madam Anderson? Chair, I, would, I would like a, a roll call on this bill, please. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Oh, actually, Senator Anderson, we're gonna lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Mitchell. Is this bill, um, are there any Republicans on the bill? Senator Mitchell. Uh, no, Senator Draskowski, but if you'd like to sign on, you're welcome. Senator Draskowski. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Mitchell. We, we saw last session when the Democrats put together huge swaths of changes in the state's election laws, breaking long time precedents here in Minnesota uh, over multiple governors of multiple parties that had agreed in the past to only pass legislation that was bipartisan. Um, and so that's what happened last session, a huge bill that passed doing wholesale changes to our election law uh, very clearly to um, impact and uh, work to try to elect more Democrats. Uh, we have another provision here that works to do the same thing um, Madam Chair and Senator Mitchell members, um, and I'm going to read off for the people of Minnesota to be aware of who is putting this bill together and forwarding it. Uh, it includes the 100% campaign, the Asian American Organizing Project, the African Career Education and Resources, AFL-CIO, AFSCME Council 5, AYADA Leads, Barbershop and Black Congregation Cooperative, CARE Minnesota, Clean Elections Minnesota, Clean Water Action, COPAL, which is an acronym that I don't know anything about, ERA Minnesota, FAYA Justia, Fair Vote, Grassroots in Action, Healthy Democracy, Healthy People, Indivisible, in, it looks like a Spanish word, I'm not sure what it says, Inclinix, Unitix, Poor Justitia, Interfaculty Organization, Interfaith Power and Light, Jewish Community Action, Land Stewardship Project, uh, which I don't know what they'd have to do about elections except elect Democrats, League of Women Voters, same thing there, Main Street Alliance, Minnesota Association of Professional Employees, Minnesota Association of Peacemakers, Minnesota Nurses Association, another union, Minnesota Unitarian Universalist Social Justice Alliance, Minnesota Voice, Minnesota Move to Amend State Network, Muslim Coalition, Native American Community Development Institute, New Justice Project, Planned Parenthood, Pro-Choice Minnesota, I don't know what they have to, uh, other than uh, doing more um, uh, work. I don't, th I don't think we can go any more pro-choice than Minnesota is. Senator Draskowski, is there a question? We all have this handout. I'm out. almost done. I, I want, I, I'm, I'm full, dis full disclosure here, Madam Chair. SEIU, another union, Take Action Minnesota, Ajama Place, Unidos, We Win Institute, and Out Front. Those are the 40 organizations that Senator Anderson talked about that are pushing this bill uh, to elect more Democrats, and Senator Mitchell's bringing it before us, what it does, as did the last bill, in, attention, in addition to working towards policy, because we know that overwhelmingly, college campuses vote Democrat, overwhelmingly, uh, for, especially for our public institutions in the state of Minnesota. So this is very clearly established to try to 
get more people on college campuses to vote, which will turn into, Senator Mitchell and, and members, uh, will turn into more votes for Democrats. That's what the um, people pushing this bill want to happen, and, um, and I have no idea what uh, members of this committee think of that. It probably depends on which party they're in here today, Madam Chair. Um, but uh, we have, again, another mandate, and I heard the author say that it was voluntary. It is not. Uh, as soon as a, an institution requests it, the local government must establish an additional polling place, and they apparently have not been consulted on the bill, and it's another unfunded mandate on them, just as the last bill was an unfunded mandate on schools. Another bad idea, uh, for partisan reasons this bill is put together, um, it's the, the motivations here behind this bill are transparent to the people in the public, to me, to others, simply another effort to elect Democrats by Democrats with their consortium of supporters. Um, not even a semblance, Senator Mitchell, of bipartisanship, not even an effort to find bipartisanship on issues like this. And instead, we're gonna cram it through and uh, push it through onto the people of Minnesota again like we did last year. Very disappointed. Thank you for uh, your indulgence, Madam Chair. Thank you for your commentary, Senator Drozkowski. Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's a lot of the points have already been touched on with the must this and the must that. We have letters from the lead. We heard from the counties. They want uh, to be considered for the extra cost. The cities want the would like consideration for the flexibility. They'd like the musts put out there in May. Um, so to that end, I would like to offer the A8 amendment. And if you're, you'll indulge me, I'll describe it while it's being distributed. Senator Barr offers the A8 amendment. Go ahead, Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the A8 says that if one, of, if one of these polling places is established, well, I guess it's must, but then I have questions there. The polling place must be at a location that is agreed upon between the institution and the county. And I guess if they never agreed on one, there may not be one actually implemented. But if they did agree on a polling place, this the A8 amendment would say that the institution that requests this extra polling place, one day polling place, would pay for all costs incur, uh, costs um, pursuant to the to the paragraph for this location. That's the A8, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Barr. Senator Mitchell, do you have a comment on the proposed A8 amendment? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, this was also uh, introduced in elections and that would have been the appropriate place for this particular amendment given the jurisdictions of the different committees. Um, but I will just say what I said there, which was um, to make a, a place offering the polling, pay for the polling, basically is an imposition of a poll tax because you were asking, um, in this case, the students, because you know that's who pays the tuition and pays for the university, to pay for the right to vote. And that is just not how we do it in Minnesota. And, and as I clearly stated, um, this type of polling option would be available to anyone in the community. Anyone in the county could come that day. So even if it wasn't such a clear, um, perversion of just how we do it to make sure our, our elections are accessible. Um, it also wouldn't even capture who might actually be at the poll that day. But this is something, as I said, that we as Minnesotans have decided that we make accessible to everyone. And that is the point of this. Uh, I don't know how any individual student is going to vote. If someone thinks students vote one way or the another, another, maybe they should just engage that population and not try and suppress their vote. But I think we need to make sure that people in Minnesota have the access to vote, especially young people who at a college campus might not have transportation. We do this for seniors that we know don't have transportation. We go to their location, we make sure they vote. Um, especially for young people, if they start that habit early, it makes them more engaged citizens, which we should all want. We should not be trying to suppress this. So I do not think this is uh, an appropriate way to fund our polling places. 
um, and it is not the value that we have as Minnesotans. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Uh, so, did you have another comment, Senator Barr? Um, yeah, I guess. I don't know, should I respond to that or should we vote first? We were holding your glasses up. I'm so sorry. I, I thought you were a signaling. Yeah, I, uh, I have I a question. Think, sh shall we vote first? Well, let, let me just respond to that first and then we'll vote. Senator Barr. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, as far as the jurisdictional stuff, the counties is local government. They, that's what we are here for. The schools that would be uh, that this applies to are all over 1,500 in size, and every and in the elections committee you testified to the, as to the number of those schools, and every one of them receipts, receives state funding. So, in essence, this, the taxpayers are actually paying for this. Uh, it's not the a poll tax. The the funding comes from multi, a multitude of sources, including the taxpayers and the general fund of the state and the counties through their levies and sales taxes that they uh, they implement on there's the citizens in each of those counties. And if we're going to do a must, if if we must have this pop up a one day polling place, then um, the people who are requesting it should probably pay for it like we do anything else. Um, to some of the other things, there was a ton of trigger words in there, but uh, I don't think anybody's actually trying to suppress anybody's vote when we have 46 days for an election season. We have mail-in ballots. You don't need any transportation for a mail-in ballot. The Postal Service will actually bring it to you and take it and go turn it in. So I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding why there's such opposition for, since it's only $1,000 why the, the the institution requesting this isn't willing to pay for it. Thank them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, members, we're going to vote on the A8 amendment. Madam Chair, Sen request a roll call. Senator Curran requests a roll call. A roll call uh, will be done. Uh, with that, uh, the clerk will take the roll on the A8 amendment. Chair Morrison? No. Chair Desick? No. Senator and uh, Anderson? Yes. Sen Senator Barr? Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Swadzinski? No. Senator Dreskowski? Aye. Senator Fate? No. Senator Gustafson? Senator Gustafson? Uh, Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Coran? Aye. Aye. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McQuaid? No. Senator Mitchell? No. Uh, six ayes and seven nays. The amendment is does not pass and is not adopted. Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, you know when we when we had this in elections, you know pop up locations. I, I think it was reiterated, reaffirmed today by by Mr. Olson that you granted the ability of the counties for pop up locations or the flexibility for new locations, which is pretty broad, and. And I'm firmly, a firm belief that they do a great job at administering those elections. And if they had a need or discovered a need that was an underserved populations, I believe our elections officials would have acted upon that. And so um, we haven't even test driven, or they may have not determined a need. And so we haven't test driven the last legislative or laws in the election um, from elections, which, by the way, for the public, the rules haven't even been published from last year's rules before we're changing them this year. Um, so with that, I, uh, I think that these events at the schools, as they were testified um, last time, it sounded like a great event, but it really starts to stretch beyond, is it actually a polling place of need versus a rock the vote or a persuasion um, day of action and, and not a polling place. And so uh, Senator Barr described we have 46 days, we have mail and ballot, you, you can get registered anywhere. We'll automatically register you. There are no barriers to, to voting, um, regardless of transportation. 
And so with that, um, I'm concerned that the intent of the, of the polling place is an actual polling place. And so they've already been granted, or you're going to pass this, but if it truly is a polling place, I'd like to um, make sure it is just that. So I'd like to move the A9 amendment. Uh, Senator Curran moves the A9 amendment. Madam Chair, I can discuss it as they're handed out. As Thank well. you. Go ahead, Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so with the A9 amendment, what it really does is, is because this has been before us a couple times, and, and it has been consistent that it really wasn't the describing a polling place. It was describing an event. And elections are events. Well, now ours is a season now, a long event. But in this case, they described it as more than a polling place. And so I have a concern about that. We have so many rules and laws, and we're still about to find out what, what they were from last year. But in this case, um, we talk about influence 100 feet from a polling place. But when you talk about having this on a college campus, there could be many different things that influence somebody's, uh, that, that would violate those laws as it re relates to influence versus polling or persuasion. And so, or, or voting. And so with this, this amendment just disallows political events or groups in the same building as a temporary polling place or within 100 feet. And so that would really just bring it in. We're not talking about the entire campus. We're talking about that building um, to remove persuasion, because that's really what this, these events are described as, in, in, in relation to it not just being a new polling place. So I would uh, encourage a yes vote as well as uh, request a roll call. Senator Mitchell, roll call's request or roll call is granted. Senator Mitchell, do you have a comment on the A? Yeah, yes, nine I, amendment. Yes, I do. I would encourage a no vote. Um, one, this was not brought to me in advance. Um, two, I can state as an election judge and someone who's also helped with early voting that um, many of these requirements uh, about candidates being within a certain distance, things of that nature, are already in our law. Um, but this would actually make our current law even more restrictive because it says within 100 feet of a building. And so one of the things that, that we brought forward in uh, elections last year is that when you talk 100 feet of a building, like one of our early voting sites is our community center in Woodbury and it is also attached to a gym and it is attached to a senior center. And by saying 100 feet from a building, you might actually be... Uh, on a campus where things are attached by skyways and underground and all attached, you might be in, uh, precluding something that is, that is hundreds if not thousands of feet away by doing this. What we actually have in law um, now is that for early voting, which this would be a type of, it would be 100 feet from the door of where the polling place is. Not the building door, but the you know, the, the place that is being, um, the election is being conferred. And it does already include the political parties and things of that nature. So I really think this um, goes well beyond the scope of what we already have contemplated in our current law. And many of the things, as I said, like candidates are already not allowed to be in this space. So I, I again, would just oppose this amendment for a variety of reasons. Met. Members, further discussion on the A9? Madam Chair. Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're talking specifically about this pop-up location. And so um, candidates and all those are bound to it. But this is a unique um, opportunity or a unique instance that this pop-up location is specific to political events and groups. Many of the, I think your former testifiers are consent consistent testifiers in this group would identify themselves as nonprofit, nonpartisans, typically filled with one ideology. And so those are, the event, those are the people who were here testifying before us that talked about and implied that it's more than a polling place, that they talked about the events and the activities that they hold. And so if it really was just a polling place, this would be a great amendment to guarantee that this is truly a nonpartisan opportunity, and so I encourage a, a yes vote. Thank you. Uh, Madam Senator Chair, if Mitchell. I may, I just want to uh, reframe what that previous testimony in elections was. These were students that were excited and trying to encourage people to register and to vote. These were not campaign events, and I think it would be very disparate to take one early voting location that relates to college students and say, let's have a whole different set of rules 
than we already have for all of our other early voting locations. Because again, that seems uh, very inconsistent that we would set a different set of rules for potential college students and, and where and how they could vote and all the activities surrounding that than we would set for any other early voting location. So I think we should be consistent and these, these locations would follow the same rules as every other early voting location. Okay, members, we're gonna vote on the A9. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Morrison? No. Chair Desick? No. Vice Chair Mitchell? No. Sen uh, Senator Anderson? Senator Barr? Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Swadzinski? No. Senator Druskowski? Aye. Senator Fatay? No. Senator uh, Gustafson? Senator Dzinski? Aye. Senator Coran? Yes. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator Maquade? No. Senator Anderson? Yes. With six ayes and seven nays, the amendment uh, fails and is not adopted. Members, further discussion on Senate File uh, 3616. Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer the A7 amendment. Uh, Senator Dreskowski offers the A7 amendment. While it's being passed around, Madam Chair, I'll describe the amendment. Senator Dreskowski. Um, I haven't seen the language yet, but I think uh, the intent is to uh, remove the 1,500 student th threshold that this bill requires for participation. And in other words, Madam Chair, Sorry. the bill is written to exclude campuses that are less than 1,500 students in population. I don't know why, uh, because the stated objective of the author was to achieve greater access to everybody, um, including places that only maybe had 15 people a day sign up. Um, so I don't understand why we are have a bill in front of us that discriminates against smaller campuses, campuses smaller than 1,500, which some people might not even describe as small to begin with. So um, that's what this amendment does. And uh, I encourage everyone's support so that we can if we're gonna put this mandate in this bill on counties and we're going to have um, a public policy decision to ram this election bill down the throat of the people of Minnesota, um, we should do it equally. Senator Mitchell, have you had the opportunity to review the A7? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It was not brought to me beforehand, but I have had a chance to review this, and I would encourage a no vote because, um, well, I find it, frankly, a little interesting that we are both saying, let's not do this, but let's also expand it at the same time. Uh, we picked the number of 1,500 because, especially for some of the smaller universities, they were online campuses or different things where students were more likely to commute. So the number 1,500 was picked because it picks some of our biggest universities where there are more people more likely to be living in dorms and things of that nature. Because we were trying to balance that this would add something to the counties with um, putting it in places where it could be most effectively used. So I think we were very mindful about how we, we did this. And as mentioned, this would kind of add the scope of uh, universities that uh, might not even have students actually on their campus. Um, so again, I would encourage a no vote. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Further discussion on the A7. Okay, members, all in favor of the A7, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. No. Division. Nay. Division. Senator Drazkowski requests division. Show of hands, please, for those who want a division, who voted aye. Show of hands for those who voted aye.
Show of hands for the no's, please. Madam Chair, Senator Lang did catch his at the last minute. Uh, with uh, six eyes and seven nays, the division fails. Uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have the A11 amendment. Uh, Senator Anderson offers the A11 amendment. Also, I'm not sure I formally said that the A7 uh, was not adopted. <laughs> Senator Anderson, would you like to explain your amendment? Madam Chair, we'll wait till everybody gets there. Oh, very well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator uh, Anderson. I, I guess uh, because we're, we're doing this for uh, students uh, to uh, broaden and make them more, make, make it more available to those who are supposedly, from what the, the author of the bill says, may not have the opportunity to vote uh, because of the situation that they may be in at their school or where, whatever. I thought it might be uh, available to make, make it available to military uh, organizations who, in, within the county or the, the state, to ha have the opportunity to have a pop-up polling place offered to the, those veterans who may have the same situation that students may have. And so I'm asking for uh, consideration by the committee and I ask for a roll call vote. A roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Mitchell, do you have a comment on the A-11? Uh, yes, Senator, um, Madam Chair. I would encourage a no vote. Again, this is somewhat, something that didn't come to me ahead of time. And um, as someone coming up on 32 years of military service myself, I am not aware of any request of this by military service organizations to add this into Minnesota law. Um, I would also say that unlike college campuses where students reside and might not have housing, um, veterans do not usually uh, reside at the military service organization like the VFW or whatever else. So they would actually have to have transportation to get there in the first place, which means they would probably have that transportation to get to the early polling place that their county already provided. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, Senator Mitchell, we were at the domiciliaries uh, earlier this past year, or I should say later, uh, at Hastings and also at Minneapolis and we were at Fergus Falls to look at their facilities and I find that some of those people are on wheelchairs and basically uh, ambulatory uh, so someone's going to have to carry them to or get them to their location where their uh, polling place would be. So I'm just making this available at th those facilities that they might have the opportunity to be able to vote right in the domiciliary or in the ver veterans' home. So that's my... Uh, Madam Chair. Senator Mitchell. So again, I've said this in elections before. I know, Senator Anderson, you don't sit in elections. But um, I encourage people to come be election judges because one of the things that counties actually do is they go out to um, certain uh, facilities where the residents cannot get, uh, don't have the transportation, and we actually already have that in law, that they go and bring the ballots uh, to people who would be otherwise homebound in a nursing facility, whether it's veterans or not. And I think it's amazing that we do that. And we do that to accommodate our seniors 
and I don't hear anyone uh, you know, fussing about accommodating the seniors without transportation, but that's why we actually already have that, that policy, would, which would also apply to the veterans' homes. So I think we already have those procedures in place, which I think is wonderful. And again, today I'm just trying to extend that to the other end of the uh, age spectrum that might not have transportation. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Members, you, or, sorry, Chair. Anderson, do you have a follow-up? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Senator Mitchell, I, I just think uh, if, if we can have it on one end of the spectrum, we can have it on the other end. And uh, these individuals who um, went through HE double toothpicks to fight for our country and are now very often, as my father was not very often to ask for help, um, we now go to nursing homes from our counties to help those people who can't help. And so we're doing this for our veterans who basically aren't going to ask for help, but we're going to extend our help without them asking. So we're just, we're just making another step in a, a direction where sometimes we don't, when they don't ask for help, we give help instead. Thank you. Appreciate your support. Senator Mitchell, I think you responded, but do you have a further comment? So I would just like to reiterate uh, that for nursing home facilities that, you know, meet this criteria, this is already available. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Members, uh, we are going to vote on the A11. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Morrison? Uh, no. Chair Desick? No. Vice Chair Mitchell? No. Senator Anderson? Yes. Senator Barr? Aye. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Swadzinski? No. Senator Druskowski? Aye. Senator Fate? No. Senator Gustafson? Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Coran? Yes. Senator Lang? Aye. Senator McQuaid? No. Uh, there being six ayes and seven noes, the amendment is not adopted. Members, further discussion on Senate File 3616. Senator Mitchell, final remarks. Again, I think uh, it, it was an amazing list of all the people that came together to support this because it just shows the need and the value in Minnesota that everyone who is eligible to vote uh, is someone that we want to enable and we have a population who has said we have a barrier to doing this has been very clear about what, what would help remove that barrier and so I am proud to help speak for them today to um, ensure our youngest members are able to exercise their right. Thank you Senator Mitchell. With that Senate file 3616 is laid over for possible inclusion. Next up, Senator Westland, Senate File 4039. Welcome to the testifiers table. <laughs> when you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this may be my first tour of state and local government. Um, so thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, this is a bill, um, whoops, let me get the right thing here. So basically, uh, this bill provides for um, the movement of uh, local uh, governments that administer elections to a .gov uh, website domain. As folks will be aware, we actually made that transition ourselves. Uh, Minute has actually been promoting the adoption of .gov web domains by local governments for a number of years at this point, uh, including their whole of state cybersecurity plan. The Office of Secretary of State has indicated there are 142 cities which currently administer absentee balloting, and the League of Minnesota Cities has indicated that 51 of those cities currently do not have a .gov web domain. Data from the Federal Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency indicates that 180 local governments across the state have registered some form of .gov web domain, although not all of that number 
may be using them as their public elections website. The intention of the bill, uh, Madam Chair, is really to um, provide some sense of security uh, for those who may be looking for elections information to know that the website that they are on is in fact a website providing accurate information regarding elections. Of course, the, uh, the change in local web domain would affect other than the elections part of the city or local government. Um, so I believe um, Ms. Freeman is here from the Office of Secretary of State. She would be happy to um, add any additional information. I will say that voter funds are available uh, for local um, jurisdictions to use in making this transition. And one of the changes that we did make in um, the Elections Committee was to uh, change the deadline by which uh, municipalities and counties would need to have transition to .gov. Thank you, Senator Westland. Members, questions, discussion? Senator Coran. Madam Chair, thank you. And Senator Westland, I think the, you know, the, the piece that we want to know is at, at the last time in the elections was about the cost. And so um, we hope that it would be covered, but it sounded like it could be fairly expensive for many of our cities to go through it. And again, I, I think it's a great, all of them should go to a .gov, but why it's being driven by um, absentee ballot, that balloting is, is still uh, um, under, misunderstood or, or not understood by me to why it would drive it when they were already migrating to those sites. And so they're already doing it. I get it. There's a pool of money to help some of them, but there isn't a pool of money to help all of them. And so that's, that's a real challenge. Um, they're moving there, and so we should have just, we should have figured out another way to fund all of them if we were going to impose that um, instead of just a subset. So um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Wesson. Senator Wesson, do you have a, okay. Members, other questions, discussion? Okay, thank you, Senator Wesson. With that, Senate File 4039 is laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Westland, welcome back. <laughs> uh, looks like Senate File 4432 is up next. Please proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and perhaps, um, I, I guess one question that I would raise at this point is uh, which portion of this bill um, is subject to the jurisdiction of uh, state and local government. I believe it's the repealer section, but I would like some clarity on that. Ms. White, please help us. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, members, um, regarding the jurisdiction of Senate File 4432, um, Section 1 affects local elections. It expands electronic submission of absentee ballot applications to local elections, and it does not apply to towns. Section 5 modifies the county um, reporting of votes on election day. Section six modifies the county auditor election night duties. And section seven um, is a Hennepin County special law repealer regarding the election of city commissioner or uh, county commissioners. Senator Westland. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, there are a number of provisions in this bill um, and certainly happy to talk about any of them. Currently, with, um, with local elections that happen in particularly um, odd years, uh, those who wish to vote by absentee are not able to complete that application online. So Section 1 actually provides an opportunity for individuals to do online applications for, for absentee ballot. Um, the second section, eligibility certificate, this actually re allows those who are voting by absentee to have someone witness their ballot who is at least 18 years of age on or before the day of election and a citizen of the United States. Um, they also can use a notary. We do note that there are some folks who may be snowbirds or outside of the state of Minnesota. This change is being made because currently 
uh, the law requires that either a person who is a citizen of Minnesota or a notary provide that witness. We have provided for uh, exit polling and some language around ex exit polling in terms of who um, is allowed to do it and the credentials that they need to present in order to participate in election exit polling. In Section 5, one of the challenges that the counties uh, have found, certainly Hennepin County brought this to our attention, is that we expanded the ability for voters to turn in an absentee ballot from 3 p.m. on Election Day to 8 p.m. on Election Day. And what ended up happening, or what can happen in the future, is that they are not able currently to release those results until all of those absentee ballots have been uh, counted and accounted for. And this allows the um, election judge to provide an initial re result of re the, excuse me, initial reporting results um, for a precinct uh, and also to indicate how many absentee ballots remain uh, and have not been yet counted. Section 6. Um, section, section 6 will actually be removed at some point. Um, this requires the county auditor basically to stay and count votes until they're done. Uh, but it does have a provision in here that would allow them to adjourn. And that language is actually going to be removed at a different point in this process. And then lastly, the repealer um, in essence, right now, uh, the, the current law requires um, a two-week space between a special election and a primary if there are more than two candidates. Uh, this conflicts with how state law governs special elections. It makes the timeline very difficult and confusing for election officials. And so we are repealing that so that the state provisions will apply. And I have a testifier here specifically who can provide additional information. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Kristen Zapetta, and I am the operations manager for Hennepin County Elections. Um, I'm testifying today in support of this bill, Senate File 4432, and just wanted to highlight a few sections that we support. Um, first, Section 1, that will allow the absentee ballot application to be open for local elections. Under the current law, it's only open for federal, state, and county elections. And during local elections, many voters are frustrated that they cannot apply for an absentee ballot online. Second, we support Section 2 that will allow a witness of an absentee ballot to be any U.S. citizen who's 18 years of age or older instead of the current requirement that they be a Minnesota voter. A lot of our absentee voters are voting absentee because they're visiting a different state and often have difficulty finding a Minnesota voter, in which case they need to find a notary and pay for it, um, which also can be difficult in some very remote areas. Um, we also support Section 5, which makes changes to the results reporting options. Last year, the legislature changed the absentee ballot drop-off deadline from, of 3 p.m. to be 8 p.m. on Election Day. Um, due to that change and specifically Hennepin County's physical size and complexity, it's difficult for us to get a ballot that's dropped off at a city absentee voting location, um, delivered to our centralized absentee voting um, machines and accepted or rejected. And then if it's accepted, counted in time to report timely on election night. Um, without this change, we fear that this would cause a significant delay in all results reporting in Hennepin County um, and have estimated that we may not be able to begin reporting any results on election night until near midnight in November. Um, this change would allow us to report the majority of votes and the number of remaining ballots that we have left to count. And then we would add those votes to the totals in a supplemental update later in the evening. And finally, uh, we support Section 7, which is a repeal of the Hennepin County specific statute, which governs the special elections of Hennepin County commissioners. Um, the current special election uh, timelines are really out of date, and they call for a super shortened timeline. So this spring, we have a special election for a county commissioner, and we're required to hold a primary just two weeks before the special general election. Uh, this shortened timeline makes 
um, it really difficult, if not impossible, for any voters who are voting overseas to vote absentee in that special election. Um, the repeal would allow Hennepin County to hold special elections that follow the regular statutes and timelines. We also support the sections on exit polling, but we'll let the Secretary of State's office or Senator Westland answer any questions on that. Um, I'll also add that the Secretary of State's office is um, supportive of this bill. Thank you for your time, and I'm here for questions. Thank you for your testimony. Members, discussion? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Weston, I see this bill uh, is basically uh, approved by Hennepin County. They like the bill. How about the rest of the counties? Senator Weston. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Anderson. I know when we heard this in committee and elections, um, I, I believe Oh. I'd like to phone a friend. <laughs> Please state your name again for I the record. I apologize. I wasn't sure if we had someone from the, the, other, the counties here. here. Thank you. Here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Troy Olson, um, representing the Minnesota Association of County Officers, and the, the association is fine with this bill and uh, really doesn't have an, a position if all the, all the provisions uh, work for us. Thank you. Senator Madam Anderson? Chair, we have to ask these testifiers to talk into the microphone, please. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder, Senator Anderson. <laughs> Further discussion? Okay, well, all in favor, or actually, we're laying this one over for possible inclusion. Senate File 4432 is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Westland. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, do you have any um, updates? For us? Oh, we have one more. <laughs> Senator Carlson. Okay. Senator Carlson, welcome to the testifiers table. Whenever you're ready, please share Senate file 3555 with us. Thank you, Bjorn. Madam Chair and members, uh, I have Senate File <clears throat> 3555, which is a stra fairly straightforward bill that aims to promote the and ensure transparency and accountability with voters when vacancies arise in key local offices. Under current law, if the vac vacancy arises during the four-year term of the office of a county attorney or the county sheriff, the county only has two options. One is to must appoint an individual to fill the vac vacancy. Actually, they only have one option because they can't go to a special election. This legislation would simply adjust the law to allow the county board the option to either make a special appointment or call or call for a special election to fill the vacancy if there's time before the end of the term. If candidates have already filed for election for the new county attorney or county sheriff and it's too late to have a special election, they can't appoint. It gives the county board the option to make an appointment and simply let the person who wins the November general election take the post immediately. Uh, I have Dakota County Commissioner, Ms. Lori Halverson, to provide supporting testimony. And I also have, uh, as uh, phoning a friend here, I have Mr. Matt Mossman, Executive Director of MICA, to answer any other questions. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Chair. Carlson. Welcome to the testifiers table, Commissioner. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I am Lori Halverson. I am a uh, county commissioner from Dakota County and uh, appreciate uh, Senator Carlson bringing this bill forward. Uh, a few years ago when I was a new county commissioner, um, having get, gotten to serve up here in the legislature, um, we had a situation after 30 years, our county attorney uh, resigned midterm and we had to fill that vacancy. And because it is such a rare event um, and I was new, I was quite shocked to find out that it was our only um, option to appoint a successor. Um, and as we were going through the process, um, we were being 
um, lobbied by outside uh, organizations. We had a number of people put their, their names forward um, and had to come up with a process uh, to interview those folks. And as I was going through that process, it became very clear to me that I was in the way of the voters and who was going to represent them. County attorney and sheriff um, are extremely important elected officials in our counties, and they play a very special role and have a unique relationship um, with uh, county boards compared to other um, uh, elected offices. And that is, not only do they serve um, the, their constituents, but they also have a, a role that they play in service to county boards. If uh, County boards are ever in a situation of having to get legal counsel, um, having to uh, go to the courts. Uh, it is the county attorney that represents us. Um, and the same is true at the sheriff. Uh, the sheriff's office provides important um, public safety uh, responsibilities to our communities. Um, however, they also have a relationship with county boards in that they are providing our security as well. And so uh, because of that unique relationship, it felt um, uh, like an opportunity for us to talk about ways to uh, let voters have a bigger say in the process. Um, this bill seeks to strike a balance to ensure that counties have the option. We, You all know very well how much local control matters uh, to county governments and county boards. And, and uh, Senator Carlson mentioned that there may be opportunities uh, uh, there may be incidents where counties decide that appointment is the best option moving forward um, prior to uh, a general election. Um, but there are also uh, times where county boards um, would much prefer to let the voters have their say. And um, that is why this bill is in front of you today. And happy to answer any questions and uh, happy to, uh, and I ask for your support for uh, Senate file 3555. Thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Members, questions, discussion? We've reached the end of the hour. Madam Chair. Oh, sorry, Senator Cran. I, like I did not I see you. I would like you. to say it was great for Senator Carlson to bring forth a great bill. I can hardly believe we're here in 2024, and this is when it's being brought up. Finally, it, it's good. I'm glad, I'm glad we're doing it. It's hard to believe we got to this point where we didn't, you didn't have that latitude. So um, I'm glad. Thank you, Senator Carlson, for bringing it forward. Thank you, Senator Coran. Senator Carlson. Madam Chair, I, I did arrange some open spots for co-sponsors. Yeah. Uh, we do have uh, bipartisan sponsorship from the other body. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Further discussion? Okay, members, all in favor of Senate File 3555, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Okay, Senate File 3555 passes uh, and will be placed on the general orders. We have the Minnesota Historical Society coming to the testifier's table. Thank you for being here. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Kent Whitworth, serve as the director and CEO of the Minnesota Historical Society. My colleague. Madam Chair, I'm David Kelleher with the Minnesota Historical Society. And with us, uh, in case we have to phone a friend, is Murray Bjornberg. Uh, Murray is our director of capital planning and management. Um, should we proceed? I presume it's okay to proceed? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we are grateful for the opportunity at the end of a long uh, committee um, meeting to just say a few words about uh, the Minnesota Historical Society, touch very briefly on the mission and strategic priorities, and then uh, really lean into our capital budget request and hopefully you'll see the relationship between our mission delivery and the importance of the facilities where that work unfolds. Um, so as I said, I will not uh, focus much on mission and strategic priorities. All of that is in your packet. Um, but you will see concepts like access and, and uh, virtual and physical space and sharing expertise and authority as well as sustainability as, as uh, guiding imperatives for the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, 
you will be very familiar with um, several of these requests, but we have uh, a third in there. Um, I'm going to ask David to say a few words about historic sites, asset preservation, and then I'll say a few words about uh, a PATH project that focuses on uh, preservation and access to history, and then we'll conclude with just a light touch on county and local historic preservation grants. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as as Director uh, Whitworth mentioned, we have three requests that we're bringing before the legislature this year. First is historic sites asset preservation. We are responsible for a network of 26 historic sites, which is comprised of over 150 buildings, most of which are, or half of which are over 100 years old. Those require some special care uh, for our asset preservation needs. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, this diagram gives you a sense of uh, what our capital investment needs are. If you look at the replacement value of all of our physical facility assets, that totals about $405 million. And trying to keep up with those needs is uh, a challenge all the time. We estimate that in order to keep up with the needs, we would need to replace at a rate of 4% each year. That makes sense if you think of a roof lasts for about 25 years, you need to spend that much money to keep up with things. So if we look at that 4% of the $405 million in our uh, group of physical facilities, that would come to a little over 15 or $16 million each year to keep up with the needs that we have. If you look at this uh, table, sorry, the uh, bottom is obscured a little bit by the captioning, but we have received on average over the last 20 years under five million. So over time, the cumulative effect of underfunding historic sites asset preservation takes its toll. This is a list of the individual projects that comprise historic sites asset preservation. These are in priority order. Uh, we have about a dozen, dozen and a half projects in any given year, and what we do is take that list of projects and after appropriations are made, this is a list of uh, the work plan for the 2023 appropriation, uh, which we appreciate greatly. We're able to get caught up a little bit on historic sites asset preservation, and we are starting to do the design work on a, a number of those projects. So all of those dollars are uh, accounted for and um, planned out for the next several years. And here are some images of historic sites, asset preservation photos, um, past, present, and future requests. And we'll let you take a look at those on, on your own. Mr. Chair, we uh, have a second request that focuses on uh, preservation and access to history. And we are specifically asking for $6.7 million for design work in, in this year. Uh, the next image um, uh, will show you the variety of spaces. We have exhibit space, we have research space, educational space, and we certainly have storage space. Uh, we are the keepers of the state archives and the material culture of Minnesota we, through our three-dimensional collection. Um, if you go to the next image, David, we have been active in a master planning process for more than a year, and um, we are focused on two particular goals. First and foremost is the secure uh, collection storage of these archival and three-dimensional artifacts. Uh, requiring environmental conditions uh, for long-term preservation and access. The second component has to do with an enhanced visitor experience. And I'll transition into saying just a few words about the Minnesota History Center. All of you are familiar with that. But I bet you may not realize that it's more than 30 years old now. Uh, it, has, it has worn very well, we're pleased to report. But um, think about this. When that building opened in 1992, it was pre-internet. So the technological needs are, are dramatically different. Uh, it was pre-9-11, so think about the challenges we face from a security standpoint. And then uh, as we are now in a post-pandemic environment and we continue to wrestle with uh, the future of work 
and recreation and what those spatial needs are, all those are profound challenges that face us as we consider the next 30 to 50 years of the Minnesota uh, History Center. Um, I'll say just a few things more about the, uh, if you'll go back, I just want to say a word or two about the uh, secure collections. Some of you are familiar with an off-site storage facility we have at 1500 Mississippi here in St. Paul. Uh, that building uh, was state-of-the-art 50 years ago, which I maybe ought to put that in quotes, but um, that building has frankly outlived its usefulness and we are using sort of baling toy, baling twine and, and duct tape to keep that going. Um, so we are uh, needing to move into a, uh, uh, a new facility that we think we will uh, need to build uh, off-site from the History Center. There is some good news though in the Minnesota History Center. When that building opened 31 and a half years ago, there was uh, unfinished space that was uh, set aside for such a time as this. So we also need to outfit unfinished expansion space. We think that'll uh, address many of our archival needs. Um, and so if you haven't seen, you've seen the History Center, if you haven't seen our offsite storage facility, that might be quite illuminating. It might provide valuable context to our request. Um, as I said, we've been actively involved in the um, master planning process, uh, looking very carefully at all the 400,000 square feet plus in the History Center. This is just an image that shows you the range of storage needs. Those boxes are full of uh, state archives. You see large artifacts, smaller artifacts. Um, this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of need. Um, and so we are um, uh, grateful for the opportunity to make the case for uh, the visitor experience needs for the next generation or two of Minnesotans, but also uh, to make the case for collection storage needs so that the tangible connections to our past are there for future generations to utilize. Mr. Chair, the third of three requests is for uh, county and local historic preservation grants. This is a competitive grant program that has been funded in the capital budget bill most years since the mid-90s. This program offers an opportunity for cities and counties to take care of their more significant, most significant historic structures. It's a matching competitive grant program uh, that typically will be used by a city or a county for, say, a county courthouse or a city hall, and they will then make sure that they do the work uh, in a historically accurate way and take care of their, their own treasures. And that grant program has been very successful with a lot of demand for those grant dollars. So, Mr. Chair, with that, we will uh, conclude with a heartfelt thank you. Thank you for the support over the over the uh, years, but thank you specifically for the uh, significant asset preservation support in the last session, and thank you uh, for making the Minnesota Historical Society uh, one of the strongest uh, organizations of its kind in the nation. We're grateful. We will stand for questions, but we won't hold our breath at this point. Thank you. I guess I'd like to ask a question here of, of uh these facilities that you, uh, you know, the re-roofs and the preservations, are any of those closed today or are in, let's say, ready to close or in, in uh, fear of closing? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if the question is reflecting the condition of these sites, uh, I know there's nothing that is uh, open to the public right now that is, uh, um, is in dire need. Um, I would say that there is substantial need at 1500 Mississippi, that off-site uh, collection storage facility. I'll just say that we are grateful uh, that we have had a mild winter. Uh, last year's uh, unusually challenging winter uh, really uh, put that facility's current condition to the test. So we do think there's urgency as it relates to uh, 1500 Mississippi off-site collection storage. Okay. Any questions from the members? Questions or comments? Yes, we're going to be meeting on Thursday for, um, is that putting together our, our uh, not yet, not putting together the budget yet. Okay. All right. And I thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for thank testifiers. You. Appreciate it. And uh, 
Yeah, good luck, Pierre. Thank Thanks. you. With that, I think uh, all of our business is finished for the, finished for the day, and the meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>